This is the Mojo, the Meaning of Life and Business podcast, where life and business intersect. Hosted by Jennifer Glass, CEO of Business Growth Strategies International and BGSI Coaching. We are dedicated to your success. Hello and welcome to another episode of Mojo, the meaning of life and business. A lot of us have some sort of product that we work with, whether it's our actual service that we deliver, it is our widgets that we invented, create, produce, market, or other kind of products like even nonprofit organizations still have a product that it is that we're offering. When we look at a product and the key to product success, it becomes extremely important for us to understand what it means to be in a position to have a successful product launch, to keep it live, and keep innovating while that product is out there so that it remains relevant. And so I have a really incredible guest on the show today For those of you that are watching on the video, you may think Larry David is on the show, but I'm going to say it's not actually Larry David. It is my friend David Frayden. But before I bring David on, let me tell you a little bit about David. David Frayden was classically trained as an HP product manager and was recruited by Apple to bring the first hard disk drive on a PC to market and later became the Apple business unit manager at the same level as Steve Jobs. He is the author of Building Insanely Great Products, Organizing and Managing Insanely Great Products, and the widely published Successful Product Design and Management, all available now on Amazon, and has trained companies such as Cisco on these topics worldwide. David, wow, welcome to the show. <laughs> Well, thank you for having me. Absolutely. Thank you. So let me ask you, product success is a really important thing, and a lot of people kind of forget the importance of paying attention to the actual product that they're selling. They're like, yeah, I know that I can get out there and I can sell whatever it is that I'm selling, but they may not be clear on what they need to do. And when we were in the green room, we were talking, and you mentioned it takes 130 skill sets to really master product success. So I'm not going to ask you to tell me all 130 skill sets, because I think we would be here for a couple of days to do that. But let me ask you, I mean, when we're looking at product success, in a high level to start, what does product success mean to you and the keys to product success? Well, product success means that you get more money out of the sale of that product or service than you put into it in the first place. Uh, About 40% of all the new products and services introduced each year fail in the marketplace because they don't follow the five keys to uh, product success. And by the way, that represents nearly a trillion dollars of wasted research and development money from which the organizations that spent that money will not get a return on their investment. Uh, So the keys to that success is uh, a neurotic of the name of my company, uh, Spice Catalyst, uh, for the word spice, where the S stands for strategy, that you need to have a 32-part product market strategy uh, before you begin the development of the product. And when I say market, I mean, that's like a grocery store. Marketing is the process of getting customers to go to that store. So you have to understand what your market is and what the product is going to do for the people and or the companies, if it's B2B or business to business uh, in that market uh, place. Um, And that's the first most important part is the product market strategy. The uh, P stands for having a repeatable process in developing the product. One of my clients a few years ago had five products they brought to market. All five failed because they did not have a repeatable framework for product uh, development 
they uh, they ended up developing a culture of blame within the organization, where they would point fingers at each other as to why the product failed. The I in SPICE stands for having the information available uh, to the managers to make decisions about the product. The C is having the customers in terms of understanding who it is that are your customers and exactly what it is they want to do. It's not what they want, it's not what they need because a customer, if he or she understood what they wanted, that means they understand the problem that they have and they've also have defined the solution to that problem. That's why, for example, when Henry Ford in the early 1900s was thinking about making a cheap mass produced car, he went out and asked people, uh, would you, uh, do you want a car? And everybody said, no, I don't want a car. I want a faster horse. But if he had gone out and observed what people were doing, whipping their horses to get from one side of Dearborn, Michigan to the other side, he would have known by observing what people do, the problem that he had to solve. And that was solved with an internal combustion engine on a, on a four wheeled uh, carriage, uh, hence the Model T uh, car or automobile. And then lastly, the point you mentioned earlier, the E in SPICE stands having, for having the employees trained uh, or come on board uh, with all of the 130 uh, uh, competencies or skill sets spread across, obviously, the team. That if you're missing major portions of that, uh, you're not going to have a successful product in development and or at product introduction or later on in a, in a sustaining manner. And thank you. And that's really uh, good in terms of an outline that we need to be looking at in terms of what it is that we're doing and going from there. And I just want to reiterate one thing. You mentioned $1 trillion in R&D costs that will not see a return on investment by the companies for missing those core pieces and what it is that they're doing. And just to illustrate that, I mean, think about it in your own product development. If you're listening to this, what is it that you're actually doing? How are you paying attention to this? How are you um, really figuring out what your product is so that you're not going to be losing a significant amount of the investment that you're uh, making on your product development? And if you think you're not actually developing a product, I hate to break it to you, but you're wrong. Everybody is developing a product. Even if it's something as simple as a commodity, right? I mean, we're all selling uh, this particular widget or this particular service, right? Let's say that you're an air conditioning repair company. Your product is still how you fulfill your air conditioning repair service. And so if you think that it's just, oh, I don't sell a widget, you're wrong and you really need to be thinking about what it means to be in that position. And so you really want to go back and listen to what David just mentioned with the acronym for SPICE and really hear what David was saying now in that perspective now from where you now are realizing I have a product, it's no longer just that service that I am offering. So David, let me ask you, when we are starting out in product development, right? We've got that SPICE idea that we need to be looking at. And you mentioned that um, S with the strategy, is the market strategy. So we have to see where we're actually talking, who we're talking to, what their needs are. You mentioned Henry Ford also in that idea. Um, but I guess the question is, though, is for somebody who is creating a brand new product, and they're trying to get a handle, right? I mean, a lot of inventors, as an example, are um, they're great in the lab or they're great in their garage tinkering around, but they're terrible business people. If we were to help one of those inventors, what would be something that we would say that they really need to be thinking about that would say, Right, this is exactly what it is that you need to do in terms of positioning you to having good success 
I mean, of course, no, in the market, things along those lines, but is there any one thing that would be better? Again, just about any product has some sort of market, may not have a broad appeal, but there may be a niche that's there. And if we watch Shark Tank, we know that is the case. I mean, people go on, they've had $19,000 in sales, $50,000, $2 million in sales, whatever it may be. But anything specific, though, that we can say, this is one thing you have to be thinking about? Now, the key is understanding what it is that your customer wants to do, why they want to do it, when do they want to do it, where do they want to do it, how do they want to do it, what's standing in their way, how important is it for getting that thing done, and how satisfied were they or are they with the current solution. An example is uh, if we go back to the caveman and the cave woman, and they were in their cave and they wanted to leave some drawings of the uh, cave walls or some writing uh, so they could communicate something to other people without having to be there. So they found that if they picked up a piece of burnt wood called charcoal and they scribbled on the wall that they could accomplish that thing that they wanted to do. Well, then somebody observed the fact that the caveman uh, or woman uh, did not like the idea that their hands got really dirty from the charcoal and they had to constantly wash their hands whenever they were writing on the wall. So they decided to surround the charcoal with wood and they called that a pencil. And then they noticed that the pencil kept wearing down and they had to constantly sharpen it and that they could use ink with a quill from a from a bird and use that uh, and a thing called paper that they, somebody invented. Uh, I think it was the Egyptians with papyrus and they could write on the piece of paper and now it was portable, much more portable than a slate of, uh, of uh, granite that they chiseled off of their cave wall. And then someone noticed that the, uh, the quill kept running out of ink, so the ballpoint pen was in invented. And then uh, uh, typewriters, electric typewriters, dedicated word processors, and then word processing for your personal computer and your laptop and your iPad and so forth. So that's all doing the same thing, and that is getting words down uh, or pictures down that can be used for communication. But the innovation that occurred, the invention that occurred, was to improve upon doing each of those things better or faster or with higher quality. So an inventor sitting in their garage is just not going to come up with an idea for a product unless they first start with what is the problem that the customer is trying to solve. Um, I'm pretty sure Henry uh, uh, Thomas Edison, Edison was not sitting in his lab trying to invent the electric bulb. He was trying to invent a way to make light without using a candle or without using uh, whale oil. And all uh, inventions that are successful satisfy something that a customer wants to do. And they all start with first observing, like a social anthropologist, what people do, and then interviewing people that do those same things and then doing surveys of larger numbers of people can, that can then be projected against the entire marketplace so that you have a quantifiable estimate of what the size of the market is. The, the next thing you do is you segment your market into uh, uh, of, co of common characteristics of those people that do those things or those companies that do those same things. Then you do your market research and your competitive research, and that gives you the information you need to do your product positioning, the place in the mind for your product, which lends to the brand for your product. And then you can put together your uh, pricing strategy, your distribution strategy, your sales strategy, uh, your trading uh, and support strategies. And all of that can then be rolled up into a diagram or a table that we call features, advantages, and benefits of your product. And that entire package consists your product market strategy, which will take somewhere between three to six calendar months because of the time required to do the observations and the interviews and the surveys, uh, and uh, about one to three months people time spread over those three to six months. And then you turn that all over to your engineering department or your developers, and then they can build the product specifically to solve the problem of what it is that uh, people or, or businesses want to do.
Thank you. And it's really interesting. I mean, you were talking about Edison and inventing the light bulb and wanting just to do it without using candles or whale oil and um, many other famous inventors that have invented things exactly in the same regard, trying to avoid the problem. How do they solve a different issue? And I'm just thinking all of those people that created things by accident, as an example, we all know those little stickies that we use all over the place and the glue that is on that was a mistake or um, penicillin came about because something became moldy. And there's a lot of those kinds of inventions also that happen purely by mistake. And some things that are like, that is so um, necessary, but nobody would have thought about it until somebody's like, all right, this is such a simple thing and it doesn't require this. You can just do it that way. Like you were saying, um, they didn't want to get their hands dirty with the charcoal anymore. So they stuck a between a piece of wood and they called that the pencil. Um, but if you think about it also, you know, certain things like, uh, well, we're dealing with, uh, as an example, um, I don't know, cleaning the shower and just something that makes it super easy to clean it without having to actually just rub it, right? And I actually personally had an idea until um, one of the big companies came out with something uh, exactly what I wanted to do, um, a little bit differently, but because I was told no by a couple of folks, I didn't pursue it. But neither here nor there, that's not, it's not the time or place for that conversation. Let me, let me make a comment on that. Um, if that's the kind of product you were thinking of developing for a particular problem, uh, a difficult problem of cleaning uh, the shower, uh, that's the business that Procter & Gamble is in. And they own over 150 brands and their means of innovation, uh, of uh, product discovery, of what a lot of people call design thinking, is that they go out and they observe, for example, uh, 40 housewives doing laundry over a four month period. So they do 10 a week. And by the time they get into their fourth week of just observing housewives doing their laundry, uh, they pretty much identify the problems that housewives are trying to resolve. And that's their process is to first go out and observe what it is that their customers want to do. Uh, that resulted in the, what's the little pod thing that you get from ivory that you just throw the pod into your, uh, into your washing machine or uh, stick it to your kid's mouth to see if its mouth will explode. Uh, that latter use, no one anticipated that anybody would be that stupid to do that. Uh, the guy at 3M that invented the stick, sticky notes or post-it notes or something that's called like that. Post -it, he, yeah. he had just happened to invent a glue that wasn't as, because 3M was, in the, was and is in the glue business. He had invented a glue that wasn't that sticky. But he noticed people throughout the office had taken little pieces of paper with probably 3M scotch tape and taped it to their monitors or to their walls or, or whatever. And he said, whoa, what if I put this uh, 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 slightly sticky glue on the back of this paper, I could have a, ha have a whole new product. Uh, certainly the uh, Goodyear brothers that were trying to invent tires uh, had no idea that they would accidentally knock some sulfur off the shelf and it would fall in the vat of rubber. And uh, they discovered vulcanization, which does something to enable them to make tires. So yeah, in your pursuit of trying to develop a product or a service that satisfies what it is that you already know customers want to do, uh, accidents could occur serendipity could occur and you could discover a new way of doing something that's called innovation, faster or better or with style. Uh, another example I could give of that is if uh, Travis, the founder of Uber, uh, grew up in Washington DC or New York City instead of Los Angeles, uh, his problem that he had in LA was that there was all these cars running around, uh, the smartphone was there. so. Uh, uh, Steve Jobs's idea of putting the internet in your pocket uh, so you can have a smart application in your hand 
And uh, he probably experienced what I've experienced in LA years ago. I would call a cab and the cab would not show up. Then I call back the dispatcher and the line was busy. I finally get through, they put me on hold for 10 minutes. Then they'll tell me that the cab is on its way and then it doesn't show up, so I have to call them again. So Travis had the idea that if I just put in where it is that I'm at, oh, wait a minute, GPS knows where I'm at. So all I have to do is put in where it is that I wanna go. When I wanna leave, it will calculate based upon the demand at the time, how much it's gonna cost and then show me a cute little map of cars backing up a one-way street, uh, trying to get to wherever I'm standing to waiting for the pickup. But if I was in, uh, if he was in New York or Washington and I used to uh, have offices there or live there, uh, if all I did was like this, scratch my nose, 10 cabs would pull up and, and uh, to try to pick me up as a ride. Because the way you would hail a cab in New York or Washington is go like this, and they're all patrolling around on the roads, ro roaming around, uh, looking for fares to pick up. So he would not have had a problem of getting a ride for point A to point B in those two cities compared to a sprawling area uh, like Los Angeles. And therefore, uh, Uber from at least him would not have yet been developed. And it's interesting how you um, frame that and, you know, just putting your hand out and calling a taxi in New York uh, for anyone that is from the New York area, you certainly know what that is. I mean, sometimes they go right past you. And I mean, out of 13,000 and change yellow taxis in New York City, um, there's still plenty of those taxis when you really want them. They're still not available uh, to pick you up, believe it or not, even with Uber and Lyft. And I certainly know exactly what you mean with that one-way street backing up trying to get you especially at the airport when I'm on the phone with my driver, where exactly are you? Um, so that I can find them because you got to love how some airports have that dedicated um, ride share area. I mean, I get out at a, it's so weird still saying the Harry Reid airport. I'm so used to McCarran airport out in Vegas. And I know I get out of the terminal, I go, over to the ride chair area and they're all lined up by number, but you're trying to figure out exactly where your guy is going to end up and when they're coming and all of that. And um, you're trying to deal with, you know, hundreds of other people potentially that want the same thing and which is your car, which is their car. And it's like, all right, fine. So let's see where you can go with that. And um, I mean, what uh, Travis did with Uber is absolutely incredible uh, change in that industry what Netflix did with Blockbuster, what digital film did to Kodak. I mean, there's so many of these stories that are out there where innovation has uh, put the old major monopoly, if you will, out to pasture. I mean, there was a term, a lot of people that are of a certain generation now wouldn't even know the term Ma Bell. Um, those of us, though, that are of a certain generation or were working in the telecom industry like me, we know the term Ma Bell simply because that was the phone company and that was exactly what was out there. But if we're looking at what happened and deregulation that the government ended up putting in, forcing the companies to break up, forcing the um, all sorts of additional com uh, competition. And then you had uh, cell phones um, coming around, which really continued to change things. I mean, you used to hear, um, it was the ma three major companies, right? AT&T, MCI, and Sprint were the three primary long distance companies. Sprint, AT&T became uh, cell phone companies too. And Verizon ended up becoming a major player, even though Verizon was a local phone company when they first started. That was New York, 9X, um, what was it, 9X and New York Telephone, I think, um, when they merged to become Verizon. And it was just amazing how that happened. But the key takeaway here is if you're not putting your, if you're not innovating and putting your own business out to pasture, someone else is. Yeah, it's very key to um, what they call it, um, 
uh, well, sunset your own products. Uh, I forget the exact term that's used. Uh, early on in um, Apple's days when, when Steve was there, there was two Steve Jobs, the one that, that I tried to stay as far away from as possible when I was Apple at Apple in the early 80s because the guy was nuts. Uh, he, uh, uh, he was against cannibalizing his own products. Uh, later, uh, after he had his failure, first on the Apple III, and I was the fourth product manager of the Apple III and trying to clean up the mess that he created. And then when he had his failure of the Macintosh, which resulted in his failure in 19, or his firing in 1985, because he sold 100,000 of them to developers and developers found out they couldn't write anything for it. The largest program was only 10 kilobytes. Uh, and he was trying to sell it as an office computer. And it could did not have a word processing program on it. It did not have a spreadsheet. It could not print letter quality uh, printing because it couldn't connect to a letter quality printer. Uh, it could not do accounting because the size of the disk drive was uh, too small. Um, he uh, And he got fired a few months later after Macintosh sales in January of 1985 dropped to four units. Uh, he then went on and created another company called uh, Next, and he mispositioned the product in the marketplace. It was a $10,000 product where most personal computers were selling around two or $3,000, and no one could understand why they wanted a $10,000 uh, computer on their desk. Well, universities discovered, and he had tried to position it that way, that this was a computer, the equivalent of a mainframe IBM 360 or IBM 370 computer, and a professor could have the equivalent to that compute power on their desk, as opposed to going to the uh, shared computing services uh, on campus. But he didn't position it strong enough that way. So I remember being interviewed by Business Week magazine when I was the associate director of the personal computer industry service and a market research firm called DataQuest, which is now part of the Gartner Group. And uh, she asked me, what did I think of next? And I said, last. And sure enough, a year or so later, uh, Steve was out of the computer business. He bought Pixar. I was struggling greatly with Pixar in the late 1980s. And I found in my research for my book, uh, Building and Sailing Great Products, that he sought out and he got some private mentoring by David Packard, the P and the Hewlett Packard company. And I knew Dave very well because when I was in corporate PR a few years earlier at HP, I handled Dave's uh, personal PR as his uh, as a chairman of the Hewlett Packard uh, Board of Directors. And Dave came out of that same Procter and Gamble, uh, uh, understanding what it is that your customer wants to do by observing, because the field of product management I prefer to call it product success management came from brand management in 1932 for Procter & Gamble to Hewlett Packard in 1938. And uh, Dave Packard and Bill Hewlett led the drive for that. And that's why there are millions of what I call product success managers worldwide, understanding what it is that their product wants to do. And as Dave taught Steve in the late 80s, don't be afraid to cannibalize your own product. Uh, an example of not doing that is the failure of Eastman Kodak, the film company. Guess who invented digital photography? Uh, Kodak did, and I think it was around 1973. But the sales force was concerned that their sales of film, both still film and motion picture film, which they dominated uh, for decades, uh, were afraid that it would reduce their income uh, their, and their sales commissions. So they killed the uh, digital uh, uh, camera that Xerox had invented, and excuse me, uh, Kodak had invented. Then again, in the mid to late 90s, they licensed, Kodak licensed from a company uh, that I was consulting with, their digital film uh, storage, uh, sort of like SimDis. And a year later, while I was still consulting with the company, uh, Kodak uh, canceled the the uh, license for those patents, again, out of fear that it would cannibalize the uh, commission checks uh, for the sales force. And Kodak back in the 70s and 80s was one of the biggest and most successful 
largest employers of uh, people in the United States, and in particularly upstate New York, and now they are worth less than a billion dollars, mostly in the business of selling their patents off, because management there was afraid to cannibalize their own products. Uh, Apple came along later. Uh, Steve went back to Apple, took these lessons uh, to heart, and uh, he was involved in the invention, actually the acquisition of the iPod, which was a replacement to the uh, uh, the Walkman cassette player and uh, the portable disc player that Sony had and dominated the portable music market. But the digital playing of music through a little box uh, was a replacement. So um, Sony could have cannibalized their own product, but they didn't. And that opened the door for Apple and the iPod, iPod and the ecosystem connected to iTunes, uh, which was the complete solution of the complete customer solution uh, that Steve was uh, is, is very famous for doing. And then he was not a fail, fail uh, afraid when he came out with the iPhone to cannibalize the iPod market. And it took 10 years before now, just in the last year or so, Apple has discontinued the iPod uh, product line because you have the iPod on your iPhone along with a camera. And uh, strangely enough, it also does uh, telephone calls. Strangely enough, it also does telephone calls. I love that line. Um, and I mean, it's uh, interesting because one of the projects I'm working with and we talk about um, completely also changing a model um, the App Store completely changed our need to go to the electronic store, buy a disc of whatever product it is, and uh, install it on our computer. And the gentleman who actually created that and sold it to Steve Jobs, um, his name is Jesse Taylor. Uh, for those of you that um, may know who he is or look him up, um, Jesse was a guest on this show in our first season and um, is now involved in a identity privacy uh, product that I'm working with him in, but that's a completely different story. But when we're talking about changing um, things and how Steve Jobs saw the value and changing up also, how do I compete against everyone else and all of the electronic stores? and bring that in now to be part of the whole ecosystem with iTunes and the Apple uh, universe dramatically changed the trajectory of the company. I mean, if they didn't have the App Store, they wouldn't have a good chunk of the funds that they do now. And the iPhone would not be as valuable as it is now simply because all the apps would not be there without the App Store. You know, having to download it and get it from this place and that place. Who do you trust? What do you do? I mean, Apple is making a significant amount of money just through the App Store. And how many countless businesses started only because the App Store exists and being in a position to sell your app through that. And so we see that there's so many opportunities when we're looking at that to really get there. So, David, let me ask you, when we look at where we're going with product uh, success management and knowing that we really need to be paying attention to those five key areas, again, the acronym of SPICE, knowing that we need to be not afraid to cannibalize our own product or to keep innovating and put our own product out to faster, as I mentioned earlier. Um, when it comes to that, Anything else, though, that we really need to be paying attention to to make sure that our product is going to really withstand the test of time? And again, the product in the way that it exists today, not necessarily, but our company being in a position to really weather the storms or be an acquisition target. Um, anything that we should be thinking about or not thinking about in that regard? You know, something that uh, people are going to be surprised that I mentioned, uh, and that is distribution. Uh, in the case of your uh, cleaning product for a shower, sh uh, shower stall, you can have the very best product in the world, 
But if you don't have the distribution, which is the equivalent of the app store, to get the product into the hands of those people that are trying to do that same thing, you're not going to be successful. And in your case, you have been going up against the machine of uh, Procter & Gamble. Uh, likewise, uh, for many, many years, the liquor business was dominated by distributors. The beer business was dominated by distributors until state governments uh, took away or, or allowed and permitted craft breweries to occur. Now, I think in California, there's something like 1,800 craft breweries. Before, all there was was Budweiser and, uh, and, and Coors. Uh, and now you can get many, many different types and flavors of beer because that monopoly was taken away. Uh, going back to your Ma Bell, the old AT&T, uh, they had a monopoly granted to them by the government. Uh, but now that that was taken away, distribution opened up and created lots of opportunities for um, innovation. We're about to see the same thing, but it's going to be a much bigger struggle over electricity electricity production, storage, and distribution. Uh, just the other day, the first microgrid powered by buses uh, opened in Maryland. And it was a private company that uh, are leasing the buses. Uh, I think, no, I think the, the county of Maryland is buying the buses. And these two companies uh, installed batteries at this one location and charging facilities and solar panels to charge the batteries. And they're selling the electricity uh, to the bus uh, service. And then when the buses are not being used during non-peak times, they're available as battery backup for the microgrid that they've created in, uh, I think it's in Silver Spring, uh, Maryland. We're gonna see a lot more of that fighting its way through government regulation, trying to, which is trying to prevent uh, the competition by using government as a means of maintaining a monopoly. Uh, I'll give you another example of why distribution is so important. Uh, I was given credit by RCN magazine, which was, at the time in the early 2000s was the predominant uh, uh, rag for the cell phone industry as having uh, created and shipped the first advertisement on a cell phone. This was, this was 2003. Um, and I was convinced by Nokia that they had the largest worldwide market share. So I had the uh, cell phone apps developed for Nokia phones, only to find out later, uh, because I hadn't bothered to do the distribution and the market research, that Nokia was only selling uh, two phones in the United States, and they were not strong enough co computational-wise to run the games, the cell phone games that I had developed uh, for it uh, and the other applications. But I had a massive distribution of these cell phone applications in Europe. But my sales force for selling ads on cell phones were in the United States and US companies had little interest in buying ads in Europe. So I had a disconnect in distribution. And the result was I was unable to uh, continue the company and raise any venture capital funds uh, for the company. If I had kept my powder dry and waited until I understood that there was 15 unmet needs, in the words of uh, Tony Ulrich from um, Synergy, uh, and, and his books, Jobs to be Done, uh, had waited until there was a market demand for cell phone ads, then I would be part of the 15 billion plus industry today uh, for cell phone uh, advertising. So just because I was first to the market doesn't mean you're going to be successful if you ignore the issues of how you're going to get it distributed, which is in the latter part of your 32-part product market strategy. And thank you. And it's really important to keep that in mind and also just know the licensing route or the um, other routes that you may be taking, those all have their own benefits and disadvantages when you think about what it is that you're doing. And again, you want to work with someone who can give you that specific guidance on what route to take when you are trying to get your uh, product out to market. And there are specialists that can certainly work with you, uh, the right mentor, the right <clears throat> um, people behind you. And one of the things that I've said 
many, many times. You've heard me say it on this show before. You've heard me say it if you've been following me for a while. Um, elsewhere is that you need to have your own at least informal board of advisors that are there to act as um, a group of people that can back you up, give you advice uh, to help you figure things out before you need it. In other words, you want a banker before you need a loan. You want an attorney before you have a legal matter. You want an insurance guy before you have a flood in your basement. You want an accountant before the IRS comes knocking. All of those uh, concerns, you need to have those kinds of people in at least an informal board so that you know that they are there for you um, to help you make those decisions. And again, um, the right mentor, the right coach to help you figure out the licensing, the distribution, things along those lines, like David was uh, talking about. So, David, let me ask you, if people want to get more information about you, how would they be able to find you? Uh, probably best to just go to my website, uh, SpiceCatalyst, one word, dot com, and my contact information is there. Uh, or uh, search for me on LinkedIn, uh, David Fraden, um, and then uh, ask to connect with me there, and then we can message each other. Or uh, send me an email to Dave at uh, SpiceCatalyst.com. Uh, you can also go to Amazon and look up my name, and I'll show you the list of uh, books that I've written, including the ones that we've uh, talked about today. Thank you. And again, that is SpiceCatalyst.com. So that you can uh, look it up and we will certainly have that information in the notes as well uh, so that you can connect with Dave. And um, if you are looking him up, um, just listening, Dave's last name, F-R-A-D-I-N. So that way you can find him and uh, connect with Dave. So it's really important to Think about, again, what it is that you are doing with your product, what it is that you're doing when you're thinking about the strategy to launch and maintain your product in the marketplace. David, thank you so much again for being my guest on today's program. Thank you. Uh, happy to be with you. Thank you. And again, um, SpiceCatalyst.com. When you're thinking about what it is that you are going to be doing moving forward, remember, go back to that five acronym for SPICE so that you can go back and really pay close attention to what it is that you're doing, how you're going to maintain your operations and continue growing your business. On that note, this has been another episode of Mojo, The Meaning of Life and Business. And until next time, here's to your success. This has been another episode of Mojo, the Meaning of Life and Business podcast. If you like what you heard, please consider leaving us a review, liking us, or reaching out to us. You can contact us at bgsicoaching.com and let us know what you think. Thanks so much again for listening.